Welcome to this adult education, Sashini University Misinformation and Fake News in U.S. Elections course with presenter Nicholas Casas. Nicholas, or Nico, first joined Indiana University Northwest in 2017 as a visiting librarian in the role of coordinator of library instruction. He is now assistant librarian for teaching and learning and works with a team of other librarians to deliver instruction sessions for classes throughout campus with an emphasis on information literacy. Nico previously worked as a reference librarian at Morton College in Cicero, Illinois, and as a research or project coordinator at the Center for Research Libraries in Chicago, Illinois. He earned his Master of Library and Information Science from Dominican University and his Bachelor of Music Education from St. Xavier University. His research includes uh, fake news and misinformation. Thank you, Nico, for joining us for today's session. You can go ahead and screen share whenever you're ready. Thank you, Tatiana, for the wonderful introduction and everything like that. So first, I just want to kick off. Um, these are some of the goals that I want to go through um, for this program. So um, I recently did this program actually last night. I actually did this program last night at uh, Lake County Public Library, um, the Merrillville branch, um, not too far away from here, not too far away from Gary. And um, I I got a lot of really wonderful um, questions, a lot of really wonderful feedback that I've add, that I've added to this presentation. So we had a very lively discussion, um, and it was it was really wonderful, and it was really and it was also what was important to me. It was also very civil um, as well, which is which is what I what I love. Um, I've do I've done these presentations for for quite a long time already, um, and what I always tell people is before I do these presentations that, um, and it, it's really important to me, is that um, I'm not here to tell you who to vote for. Um, and I'm not, I give these presentations, I deliver these presentations through a nonpartisan lens. And I, and I take pride in that. Um, I don't re represent any political party. I don't have a political agenda. Um, what I'm here to do is to teach you what we call in the library world, information literacy techniques. So um, basically how to go out and how to find information um, and how to use the information and how that will benefit you, um, uh, how that will benefit you in, in your lives. Because information is a wonderful thing. You know, we use information every day, day and we're lucky to live in a world where information is, is very accessible um, for, for most people. So, but what I'm here to do is to show, show you information literacy techniques to help you go out and gather information so you can make um, really great decisions um, that will, at the ballot box, decisions that will serve you and then that will help you so you're not voting against your interests. So that, that is my goal. So some people, you know, when they go out and vote in the ballot box, some people, you know, vote fiscally with their wallets. Some people, um, you know, social issues are important to them and that that's really great. So either way, but the fact is, as long as you go out and vote, that that is, that's already way better than what other people do. And going into the ballot box, being informed and going out and, and seeking the information. And that's that's really important. And that in a nutshell is how, you know, part that's partly the way that we can save democracy in this country is to, by going to the ballot box, by also being informed and also voting, you know, for, for um, what we believe in and what our interests are. So um, this is, again, like I said, this is completely nonpartisan. And so my goal is to just give you information and to give you techniques that, that with everything like that. So um, so these are the goals um, that, that I have so far. So first I'm gonna go into, um, into terminology, going into um, definitions. So I want to clear up some some terminology and everything like that. But I'm going to quickly go into like a really short history of fake news um, from the 19th century all the way up into the 21st century. And then I'm going to talk about um, the SIFT method, which is a really um, a, a really uh, common uh, technique that has grown and gotten a lot of traction uh, over the years. And then I'm also going to talk about um, the five W's and what exactly that is. These are questions um, 
that that are contained in the five W's that will help you um, evaluate a, a resource, evaluate a, an article on, on the internet or anything really, anything that gives you information really, and use the five W's to evaluate it and to make sure that it's a source that is not only like legitimate, but it's also useful to you. And then I'm gonna give you examples of, um, I'm gonna show you some of my favorite fact-checking websites and what I use that will help you as well. And then we're gonna go into a few different examples, um, some of which, which are a little bit different from uh, last year. I'm gonna give you examples of memes, of images, of tweets, um, of websites that will, um, that I, we will use the SIFT method um, to, to debunk these memes. So we will we'll go ahead and, and do that. And then I'll give you some examples of some tools that I like using online. So, um, all right. So as, as we'll, I'll go on through the rest of the presentation. So, um, so when we talk about fake news, fake news is, is essentially, it's a meaningless term. Um, and it's a meaningless term is because um, people have a different lenses and a different under also a different understanding of what fake news is. So I will not use the with I know what the title of the presentation is fake news, but it's it's really it's a meaningless term of what we call for false information. And false information really falls into three different types of categories. So false information um, is, is, and as you can see the, def the definitions um, right there, and you see the, the Venn diagram that's right on the screen. So there is uh, misinformation, and then there is disinformation, and then there is also something that doesn't get talked a lot, but I wish it would, which is malinformation. Now, Misinformation and disinformation are both false. Malinformation um, has to do with things that are true. So misinformation, so it's it's false information that is spread, but you know, it no intention to harm. It might be something that was accidental or maybe something that was reported erroneously. Um, it could be, you know, misinformation could be all all types of things, or it could be. Um, something that is disinformation and that was spread by someone who had, you know, good intentions. You know, they were only spreading the word on someone until they, they figured out that, oh, I just got duped. So that that's misinformation. And then disinformation is, you know, kind of like the evil cousin, you know, spreading, you know, it's spreading false information with with intention to harm. And that's what is, you know, that we we see like quite, quite frequently. And then there is the malinformation, you know, um, so it's information that is true, that it's real, but it's used to, to, to cause, it's spread, spread to cause harm. It's also could be used to um, what we call in, in the internet world called doxing. So it could be things such as publishing uh, addresses, cell phone numbers, credit card information, social security numbers. So um, that that's malinformation. You know, that information is true, but it's being spread in order to, to cause harm. So this is an example of, a, of misinformation. So um, I give this example out to students um, a lot when I'm doing this talk. So um, as you can see here on this screen, this was a screen capture that was taken um, back in 2014 um, of the Hollywood movie star, um, Jennifer Lawrence. And so um, basically um, this was popped up that this popped up on the web and it was quickly um, taken down, but someone was able to, to screenshot it. So this is a simple of misinformation is, you know, death hoaxes, especially with celebrity death hoaxes that, you know, or, or, or like celebrity death rumors of, you know, stuff that didn't really happen, that, that hasn't happened. So this is an example of, of misinformation. It's a harmless example of misinformation, but it is an example nonetheless. And then this is an example of, of disinformation. So this is, you know, you're doing it on purpose um, for political purpose, but, it, but it's fake. So this was going on the rounds on Twitter um, uh, or X, which is formerly known as Twitter, um, that this, this, this image graphic um, came from supposedly came from the World Economic Forum, which is um, just as you know is is part of UNICEF is also part of the United Nations, 
and everything like that. So it's it's an institution that a lot of people believe in, essentially. And so someone, it seemed like someone, it came from the World Economic Forum. Basically, this image was created and it says, what will our diets look like in 2030? And it's got this, this pie chart and everything like that with no percentage numbers, no data really backing anything like this but it's saying it's it's it makes a lot of really bold claims such as because of climate change um our diets are going to look extremely different in i guess at about seven years time in the year 2030 where we'll have to eat things such as micro livestock so such as flies and cockroaches and worms um we'll need to um do uh, intermittent fasting because there's not going to be there's going to be less food um in the world um and also to meet like to meet net zero uh, carbon emissions, and so um, also with like synthetic uh, nutrients and everything like that. So, um, so that's uh, th those are um, th what it turns out that it ended up happening is that the World Economic Forum never published this. They never sent this out on any of their social media channels and everything like that. Um, it turned out that someone just took the World Economic Forum logo and um, and slapped it on this image on this pie chart. And so then they were able to, um, you know, they were, this this went viral and pretty soon everyone believed that the World Economic Forum actually, um, actually published this. And then this is an example of malinformation. So this is true information with the intent to do some harm. So this is a tweet um, of a photo of Deborah Messing the actress Deborah Messing, and I guess that um, she did something that no one, that someone in particular didn't like. So what they did is they actually leaked out her um, her cell phone number um, to 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 call her, to text her, to do some harassment. Um, we've been seeing this a lot more, especially um, in terms with um, you know with this, you especially see this with judges lately as well, or. You even we're even starting to see it a lot in library boards and school boards. If people, if you know, or or election officials that run elections at the local level, you know, we're starting to see that a lot, unfortunately. So that that's malinformation, and that this, in my opinion, um, this this is really it doesn't mean it's like worse than all three of them, but it really does some damage because it actually like strikes in the core of people. Now, all three types of the, you know, the misinformation, disinformation, the malinformation, it, the number one thing it's designed to do is to stir up emotions, is to strike fear into people. Um, and they use that to play with people's emotions in order to advance their political agenda. So you want to be careful um, to, um, you want, you want to make sure that you, um, do that um, and to make sure that you look at information from a neutral point of view and take steps to to protect yourself. So quick hi short history of, of fake news. So um, one of the earliest examples that we can find um, has to do with in the late 19th century with yellow journalism. Um, it was developed and we first see um, an early example of this in the 1880s when um, Joseph Pulitzer purchased the New York world. And so what 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 made this, what the New York world, what made it very distinguishable from other newspapers is that um, it, sens it sensationalized crime and it emphasized, you know, social change. And there are a couple of reasons why that we think that Joseph Pulitzer did this is that one, is to um, create social change, is to make changes of, of things. Um, and, and also um, what we call today is to generate more clicks. Back then is to generate to more revenue for more people to buy newspapers. You know, do you want to buy a, a paper that, you know, is neutral information or do you want to buy something that's more entertaining to read? Well, you know, most people will buy something that's more entertaining to read. So therefore, um, what what they found is that with Joseph Pulitzer's techniques in the New York world, uh, newspaper um, circulation uh, boost boosts it up. And then as we get through, it gets things get more developed in terms of tabloids up throughout the 20th century. We start to see in terms, you know, using newspapers as satire and even um, a, and satire becomes extremely big in the 80s and 90s and everything with, um, with one of the most famous examples of The Onion. Um, which, you know, really, you know, 
the best work from in, from the Onion, the the satirical newspaper, happened within the late '90s when a lot of people, you know, seeing seeing you know newspapers as being a source of like comedy and like being real serious about it was really new and was duping a lot of people. And then you know, in terms of with like social media and conspiracy theories, you know, with you know as as the digital divide, what we call it, is closing and more people are getting devices, more people are getting computers and cell phones because they're getting, um, they're, they're, they're a lot cheaper to make now. So um, it's giving people access, more access to really, really great information, but it's also giving people access to create bad information as well. Um, I argue is that with, with information, it's it's a, it's a commodity now meaning it's the same on the same level as money as oil as grain food um water and everything access to ports um information is is a commodity um because you know you can weaponize information between countries against one another um and what perfect example that we can see is from the 2016 election when Russia was meddling um, in in the U.S. In, in the U.S. elections in, in back in 2016, so um, and everything like that. So there is still though that that we're seeing a new type of digital divide, which is less about devices and more in terms of seeing things on the web from a digital native. So seeing things um, and reading laterally. So and using information literacy techniques. Um, we're seeing more of that in a digital divide rather than just access to cell phones and access to computers. Now, I'm a really big believer of freedom of speech. I'm a really big believer in, in freedom to read, obviously, since, you know, with my occupation as being a librarian. But it does not mean um, it, it does not mean that the um, it, it prevents you from freedom of litigation. You know, it doesn't prevent you from being sued. It doesn't prevent you from you know, the Bill of Rights doesn't protect you from that. So, um, and what better person to know is through with with Alex Jones um, and everything like that, who, you know, is, is infamously known as the creator of the website InfoWars and as someone who was, um, and someone who was sued for um, calling the Sandy Hook elementary school shooting a, a hoax. And so um, he lost a lot of money and he lost a lot of um, ad revenue as a result of it. So like I said, free speech doesn't mean you're free from um, free from litigation. Let's take a break for question and answer. So are there any questions or anything in the chat? We do have a chat. It says, if you're interested in more, you can subscribe to Get Smart About News from the News Literacy Project. It is a free weekly newsletter that offers a rundown of the latest topics in news literacy. Those topics include misinformation, social media, artificial intelligence, journalism, and press freedom. So, um, Kate, you beat me to the punch. I was actually going to mention, I'm actually going to mention the news, uh, newslet.org. Um, with the Get Smart newsletters um, and uh, and everything like that, and with Rumor Guard, those are really great. Another one, new, another newsletter that's really fantastic is called uh, The Sift, which is what the newsletter, what newslet.org, uh, they that's another newsletter um, they send out as well. Uh, my personal favorite is The Sift because um, they give out examples of um, busting rumors and and uh, debunking memes and tweets that go viral or TikTok reels. Um, so they do like real examples and um, how to think about. Um, now the newsletter is it's it the, with with the SIF newsletters it's really um, geared towards educators. It's really geared towards librarians and, and teachers and writing teachers and K through 12 at the university le level as well. But um, as someone who isn't, you know, if you are not a teacher, you would still be, um, it, it's still a really wonderful newsletter and it's still a really wonderful website um, to, to do that. So, and Kate, I see you said, get smart about news is for non-teachers. Yeah. So that that's the, uh, yeah. Thank you for clarifying that as well. All right. So. Um, the first technique that I want to um, to show you is called the SIFT method. And the SIFT method is um, is really designed to do some 
um, the, the idea is really to help you when you're doing um, quick fact checking. This is this method is not really designed to do some thorough research or to do thorough fact checking, but it's really handy when um, it's a really handy, I guess you can think of it as, as a shield or a protective mechanism when you are online. And so the SIFT method um, has become extremely popular and beginning a lot of tra traction um, the past few years. And it was developed by um, a, a digital literacy researcher named Mike Caulfield. And he is from uh, Washington State University uh, at, Van at Vancouver and who's pictured right there. And the SIFT method is, is really great. And it's, it's, um, it's an acronym that lists out the, the four steps of SIFT, of the SIFT method. And so the S stands for stop. I stands for investigate the source. F is find better coverage. And then T is trace claims, quotes, and media to the original context. So the idea is that you would hit each letter um, from S to I to F to T. And I will first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into um, what each letter actually like means. And then I'm going to give you some examples of, you know, techniques that you would use um, for that. So the first one I want to show you um, is stop. And this is the number one thing that um, that I think is the most important step is to stop. So think about in your own life with what you do right now. Um, think about what is the first thing you do when you wake up? Um, what it's essentially for me and for probably most of you is you pick up your phone, right? Is you pick up a device, whether it might be you have an alarm on your phone um, or um, if you're just picking up your phone to start checking maybe text messages from people, maybe you're checking Facebook or Instagram to see what's going on. But usually for a lot of people, um, you know, you immediately pick up your phone. And, some, and sometimes I get really guilty of doing this as well. Um, I've gotten a lot better at it. Um, but when you pick up your device and, um, you know, you um, sometimes like, <laughs> sometimes it makes me late for work. I might be sitting in bed for about 20 minutes checking my phone before I go out and start my day. So what, what Mike Caulfield argues is that we want to stop and be present when we are on our devices. So pay attention to actually like what you are reading and don't just scroll through TikTok and don't just scroll through Instagram and watching these videos. Actually pay attention to what you are reading and what you are watching, what you are viewing. And when you do that, um, you know, you realize, you know, is this information, is this picture, meme, video, is this serving me? Or is this maybe me carving out time for entertainment purposes? Maybe I'm just watching TikTok reels for for um, just like I'm setting aside time to relax, to view stuff on my phone, to view funny videos on my um, And also, you know, have some healthy degree of skepticism when you are um, uh, when when you are viewing a post or a meme or an image or a video. You know, be skeptical of, about it. Now, the I stands for investigate the source. And what he tells has you do is you want to do some identification, you know, look at the author, identify the author, identify the website's organization. And then what you want to do is you want to investigate that website or investigate that person by see what other websites, what other tools or fact checking websites are saying about that person and what they're saying about that organization. And you can use fact web, website fact checking websites as, as needed. Um, now the F stands for find better coverage. So you want to compare that source to other reporting outlets to other trusted news. This is especially um, useful when you are talking about if you see like a um, a, a, a seismic event or it could be a celebrity death. Um, it could be something like, you know, I mentioned earlier with the Jennifer Lawrence um, death hoax. You know, you see that, but you also want to find better coverage. See if other 
news reporting outlets are reporting the same thing. You know, yeah, TMZ may maybe reported on a famous death, but you know, maybe NBC is going to report this or CBS or ABC or Fox or any other news outlets. Let's see if they're reporting it first before jumping to conclusions. Um, now, if it's something that's a lot longer or something that's more in depth, that's really great. Um, and you know, don't be afraid if you if you don't agree with it. Maybe you disagree with the information, but you see other outlets that are reporting it, or don't uh, not only like don't agree, but don't like. Maybe you really don't like like what you read, or maybe you don't like a particular fact. Um, and if you don't like it, that's that's okay. You want to think of it in terms of if information, you know, being what it is. It's information. It's being neutral. And then the final part, which is the most important is, uh, in my opinion, it's more important is tracing back to the original source. So a lot of what we call fake, I shouldn't say fake news, a lot of misinformation and disinformation, a lot of it comes from, um, it may be stemmed in some truth, meaning it might come from a news story that they might have cherry picked or just pick the best parts to advance their political agenda. Maybe, um, you know, maybe it's a it's a video that you saw that's about 10 seconds, but maybe it's coming from a longer three or five minute video and someone with a political agenda just took a snip of it and made it go viral. Maybe there's more um, behind the story, but bad actors, they do. They like to put original sources and original reporting in a different light in order to show one side of the story. And they do that to advance their beliefs and advance their political agenda. Um, but really all in all is that you want to fit it in its appropriate context because be, because context is, is really important, is the most important. Now I mentioned earlier about um, different fact-checking websites. Um, there is, um, you know, there's factcheck.org, there's Snopes, there's PolitiFact. One that I um, that's been gaining a lot of traction. I heard about this website called Muckrack. I'd say about a few years ago. It's been around for for quite a long time, but a lot more journalists um, are using it um, as a as a net, for networking opportunities. So, what is Muckrack? Muckrack is essentially it's a website where uh, media websites and uh, journalists, content creators, can create a profile and they can. Um, lists what affiliation from what um, media outlets they are affiliated with. They can also um, have a paper trail of everything they've written about um, in the past, everything that's been published. And so each, uh, most journalists, um, they have a profile on Muckrack and you can see what other articles they have published in the past. And it's a really handy, uh, it's a really handy website. Um, also some red websites are also getting registered on Muckrack. And that's it, that's really, really, really helpful. So anything to help you fact check and anything to help you get a second or third opinion is, is always really good. Now, as you can see, I mentioned on the screen is with Wikipedia. And I, I show this to students and they're like, they they look, they look shocked. They look like um, they look like I have something in my eye, or like I, they look looks like I have like something in my hair, you know, they look at me and they freak out and they're like, oh my gosh, Wikipedia, because, you know, they were taught um, as kids and, you know, before college and high school and in middle school, they were taught not to use Wikipedia. You know, you can't use Wikipedia because Wikipedia is bad and Wikipedia has terrible information, everything like that. Well, believe it or not, professional fact checkers sometimes do use Wikipedia as a tool. Um, fact checkers in the media, librarians. Um, there's some librarians that use Wikipedia as well. There's a whole bunch of really great things that Wikipedia can do. Um, sometimes I guide students to Wikipedia if they have a topic that's really um, either really com complicated or um, if they're writing something about in pop culture that you know library databases they may not have articles about something that is very new and very recent. Um, and so what I do is I, I you help them use Wikipedia to look at the references at the bottom of the page. I use it to help them structure their paper. And I also use them to help, help them fact check as well. Now, for those who aren't familiar with Wikipedia, basically it's a free online encyclopedia, but 
anyone can create an article and anyone can edit an article. Any any person um, that can create an account or have a have access to the internet, they can create something. And so, um, but what it's kind of a double edged sword because on one hand you can get a lot of false information and you can get some vandalism, but at the same time you can get some really wonderful information that is like extremely, uh, extremely accurate. Um, maybe you can, you want to get sports statistics on your favorite um, athlete or look at a discography of all the albums and concerts from your favorite band or all the tours from your favorite band or, or, or musical artist, um, And a lot of really great things. It's really great for hobbyists. It's really people great for people with like very niche um, uh, interests but Wikipedia is used a lot as is with fact checks. So um, the reason why that is, is because Wikipedia, it's used um, people of all sides of the political spectrum. They consider Wikipedia as a neutral venue for facts and statistics. Now there are other, um, there's definitely like, I, actually I, I shouldn't say statistics um, because there's a lot, there's better, um, uh, websites such as U.S. Census data that's better with statistics. But um, in terms with um, seeing what other people are saying about particular white writers or particular websites, Wikipedia does a really, really, really great job doing that. Okay, another technique that you can use is something called the five W's. And the five W's are who, what, when, where, and why. The idea is that when you um, come upon, like, and I especially, and I use this with students in terms when they're like searching for articles on Google, um, because we're uh, professors are assigning students. You know, you want to use a mixture of articles that you know you find online through Google, and you also want to use um, scholarly academic articles from library databases. This five Ws is really great when you are doing the former, when you are looking. Um, through uh, articles on Google and you, when you're doing some searches. So the first thing, and it's very, it's a little bit similar to the SIF method. So the first one is who is, is kind of similar to the identif the I in SIFT is you want to identify, you know, who wrote this. Um, but you also want to think about, you know, are they an authority on, on the topic? Um, and also, which is also a really interesting one, um, is, you know, who benefits if you believe this source? So, in other words, you know, do they have a political agenda in mind? Um, and then there's the what. So what kind of resource is this? So is it a newspaper article? Is it an academic scholarly article that's published in a peer-reviewed journal? Or maybe it's a commercial. Maybe it's an advertisement. We're, and it's very common where you see like really well thought out informative articles that appear online. And then it ends up being like a commercial trying to sell you something. Um, so you want to, you know, think about it um, th that way. And you also want to like distinguish, you know, the difference between what a fact is and also what an opinion is. And that's really important. You know, a fact is what is, you know, factual, what is being reported. And an opinion is someone using facts to come up with opinions and to write opinion pieces that way. And then there's the when. So how old is the information? This is twofold. So this is especially useful. Like I was saying earlier with like seismic events with stuff that like happened. I'm thinking in terms of maybe if it's like of a mass shooting or a, a terrorist attack like that we had recently in Israel or um, or it could be like a death that recently happened. So the idea is that you don't want to jump the gun and come up to conclusions right away. You want to see what other outlets um uh, have have reported because usually the most misinformation that happens happens shortly after major events and that's how rumors get started and then that's how misunderstandings happen now I, I also work a lot with our health sciences students here at IU Northwest and one thing that's really important to them is because they're dealing with medicine is you know how up to date the information um, is so if you are the, the the year the I'm sorry the rule that we have is called the five year rule. So if you are you know as a consumer or someone who may not be a medical professional, if you want to research on some treatments or 
um, on some like diseases or anything or ailments, you want to make sure you look at the date of an article and you want to make sure that it's five years or less. So in other words, it could be from 2018 to 2023 because you know medical research is constantly changing. So you want to pay attention, especially when you're dealing with medical information, you want to identify the year and making sure it's five years or less. Now, the country of or so like the where, so maybe is there a country of origin? Because the reason why that is is because um, it may give give you different perspectives on uh, different lenses on the same information being reported. You know, how different does it look like if CNN, which is a which is an American media company, versus you know the BBC, which is British, versus something such as like Al Jazeera, which is a Qatari uh, media company. So you want to, you know, you want to be um, mindful of that as well. And then finally, the fifth w, the fifth W is the why. So, what's the purpose of this? You know, are they trying to, like, you know, earlier, like, is this an ad? Are they trying to sell you something? Are they trying to convince you? Um, are they sharing facts? Um, and also, like, why are you looking at this resource? Why are you doing research? Is it for? Are you doing it for entertainment purposes? Maybe you're doing some medical research. Um, maybe, you know, you're, you're doing some academic work, maybe you're writing an academic paper. So you want to, you know, be, you know, take a look at what the purpose is. And the reason why they ask you this is because you want to use information purposely and information that will serve you in order to get to the solution you are, you are looking for. So, and that will help you guide um, to get the best information. Okay, I'm going to go to the next part. So um, since we're dealing with um, U.S. elections, um, I don't know, has anyone heard of uh, Ballotpedia in here? Ballotpedia, and I will, I'm going to share my screen and show you what this looks like, but Ballotpedia, um, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's an online encyclopedia. It's kind of similar to Wikipedia, but what they do is they upload nonpartisan information about um, election candidates and about politicians who are um, who are in your um, who who are in your area. So you can look up the state that you're from, the region that you're from. Maybe you can look in your congressional district, and it will show the lists of races of the local races and national races that are going to be on your specific ballot when you are going to the polls. So what I'm going to do, and it's nonprofit and it's nonpartisan. It's people uploading different information. And I'm going to share my screen. So with Ballotpedia, um, you there's a lot of really great information, such as um, when terms are up, um, when, you know, as you can see here, it's got like the date of the Democratic uh, primary for this area for the first congressional district. The primary is May 7th of 2024 and everything like that. So um, and it gives you a whole list of information and print on this particular candidate. Sometimes what they will do is they will show you like how much money they've raised. Sometimes it will show you um, where the money is coming from. And it will sometimes go more into depth of like their, um, of their, uh, um, of their, uh, of their vote, the vote tally that they've gotten for primaries as well. So as you can see here, um, and who they've gone against and everything like that. So um, this is a really great um, resource, especially when you were talking about before election day, because this gives you neutral data. So you can go in and read about their stances. You can read about, you know, how much money they've raised. Maybe if you wanna know more about their biography and background from a neutral point of view, um, you can use Ballotpedia um, to do that. And there's a lot of really, really great information that that's on this. Okay, here's another, here's the other break. So um, are there any any questions at all? So we do have something in chat. Someone did say that they have heard of the Ballotpedia, but we also have um, a question that says, are there some newspapers that are more diligent in reporting, like maybe New York Times, the UK's The Guardian? Are there some, so are there some newspapers that are more diligent in reporting? So um, I'm, I'm thinking you mean in terms of. She clarified to say with regard to better sources of information. You said better sources? Correct. So um, in terms with like better sources, so um, 
newspapers such as the New York Times, such as the Guardian, um, the Wall Street Journal, those are considered newspaper, we call uh, newspapers of record. And newspapers are record. You can also punt in like, you know, you can also lump in the, the Chicago Tribune and other um, papers like that. So those are called newspapers of record because that's what they're designed to do. They're designed to do specific with with reporting, with with stating facts and everything like that. They may have op ed sections where they may have like people with with varying different opinions that are being published. But um, those newspapers, the newspapers of record are designed um, to to state facts and to create historical record of what's been happening. Um, that's why a lot of like, li you know, with library databases, you know, you have library databases such as the historical New York Times or the Chicago Tribune historical, um, they're, they're there because those are, they keep record of events that that happen throughout. And that's that's the true goal of newspapers is they keep a, a record um, uh, in terms of that. Now, what's also, really important that I want to emphasize is the, the critical importance of local news coverage too. You know, you have national coverage, which is really great and all, you know, you have some really great, you know, national outlets that do some amazing things. Um, but you also, local news reporting is, re is really the most important in my opinion, because it affects you daily. It, it, this is stuff that's happening that will affect you as you're, you know, driving in your neighborhood or walking in your neighborhood or just, you know, going to going going home after work, you know, you know, knowing what is going on in your block, what is going on in your neighborhood or in your town, um, that is is critically important. Um, in my opinion, that's the most important that even it trumps state or national um, national outlets. So um, and and unfortunately, you know, those are those are shrinking and it's really sad. It's it, they need more love, you know, subscribe to your local newspaper, subscribe, whether it be your paper or whether it be online, you know, um, go, maybe go to the library and um, pick up your local paper and, and, you know, you can read it that way or look at some newsletters people are publishing. Um, so, you know, that's that's really important when you want to when I think about it. Um, I, I used to teach, um, it's called a media bias chart. I don't, I don't teach that anymore because the media bias, and some of you might have heard of that before, but it, because some of it, some of that information itself is biased because you don't, I, I, I might, I'm, it's really important to like, we need to stop thinking in terms of like, what is information? What is information that will support my beliefs? You know, what is what are the Democrat papers, or what are the left wing cable news channels, or what are the Republican news channels? What are you know? We need to stop like thinking about in terms of that, and be because you know you're giving them those types of outlets a, a platform. So what you want to do is you want to um, think of terms of like what is giving you like you you, you were saying. Um, in the in the chat, Beatrice is is what is giving you diligent reporting? What is giving you accurate and factual reporting? Nico, we have a question related to the phrase you used, newspaper of record. When that phrase is used, does it mean the newspapers of record are doing independent research into the topic themselves versus other newspapers that are using someone else's source? Right. So when I talk, I, I don't, I wouldn't use the word research. I would use the word, word reporting, you know, reporters who are um, on the ground, who are actually like talking to people who are actually verifying um, um, what people are saying, um, whether it be from anonymous sources or whether it be from other sources, you know, um, I, I really do. Um, I, I think journalists do do just amazing work. Like there's there some really great journalists who does amazing work. And and sometimes what you, what's also important is, you you know, maybe find like what a journalist actually does, you know, see where the, how the sausage is made, you know, how reporting happens and how verifying sources actually happen and talking to people and everything like that. Um, so what I mean, I wouldn't use the word research. I would use the word, you know, who are doing, you know, factual reporting. Nico, we have two related questions. The first person states, now that paper newspapers are becoming obsolete, where can we go to get good, reliable local information? 
And the second person asks, what is a good local online news source for Northwest Indiana? Yeah, um, I mean, newspapers are, they, they really are taking a hit. And, okay. and uh, it's like, there's a lot of different reasons for that. There's a whole, I mean, for me, I'm not, um, I'm not in the communications department. I'm a librarian. So my specialty is not in media. Um, my, my, I do have specialty in information literacy and media literacy, but um, I wish we had like a, a communication professor um, from IU Northwest. There's a few, there's a few that I, I think I can think of at the top of my head who would be wonderful to answer that question. Um, but th like the paper newspapers themselves, yeah, that, that is dying, but there are some newspapers that are, you know, live, they have a thriving, um, you know, they post everything online where you can subscribe online. So, um, you know, you want to take a look at, you know, you have the NWI Times and you have like other newspapers. Um, I'm a recent Hoosier. I, I'm actually, I'm actually, I can list you everything for Chicago, but like uh, in terms of Northwest Indiana, I don't, um, not yet. I'm going to, I'm, I'm just starting to learn because I'm a recent Hoosier, um, who just moved into the area not too long ago. So, um, I've always been in Chicago. But, you know, um, you can also you can go into like your public library where they actually um, public libraries typically purchase and keep up to date of newspapers where you can go into a public library and you could read or, or just, you know, subscribe online to your to your local newspaper as well. I want to give you some examples that are on here. So um, that that use specifically with, you know, using the SIF method. To debunk it. So um, one example is up here is something that went viral. Um, I believe that this was <clears throat> seen by about 200,000 people worldwide. And so and I will I will let you, you know, you have this, you know, you have this image of the Prime Minister of Israel, you have Benjamin Netanyahu, who, you know, looks like he's just coughing or something. And there is a news posting that he had to be um, sent to a hospital uh, in Israel, and the reasons are not yet clear. Now, using the SIF method is that you want to stop and, you know, be mindful of what you are reading. So, um, you know, you can use misinformation, you know, it can be created using profiles of real, like, legitimate accounts. And we used to rely on verifying um, check marks such as like the blue check check mark that you see on Twitter or on X or the blue check mark that's on Facebook or Instagram where like it coming it's coming from legitimate sources now the thing is is that since X has you know gone through a lot of changes you can basically be anyone you could just have to you just need a credit card to purchase a blue check mark unfortunately so um but what what we're seeing is that they are you know, doing this to um, modify um, the names of outlets. So um, this is actually ends up being a fake, um, this ends up actually being a fake post. As you can see in the handle, you see it says Jerusalem post in the handle of the original tweet. The word, the name Jerusalem is misspelled. The Jerusalem is spelled with an A. Um, so uh, the actual news outlet wouldn't, wouldn't be doing that you know they would be you know saying you see where the at sign is where the handle is that is not the right uh jerusalem post which is actually a legitimate news source um well, actually not two hundred thousand. it's got six hundred thousand views so again you want to be mindful and you want to like pay attention because it's getting it's really it's getting harder and harder out there to distinguish from uh regular news outs, outlets real news outlets to to fake ones and then here's another example. So we're going to talking specifically about investigating the source. You want to identify and investigate the source. So um, this is a website from um, called davidike.com. And I've never heard of this. Um, maybe some people might have heard of it, but I've never heard of it. And it's got um, talking about the coronavirus um, epidemic. So what you want to do is you want to keep in mind is you can do a couple different things. You can investigate the author. So as you can see, you can identify that author. Um, the person's last name is Freeman. You can investigate them, or you can also investigate, you know, what is, what is David Icke? And you can check, um, what you can do is you can do, um, check Wikipedia 
um, which is a, one of our fact checking websites to see if they can do it. So again, you want to identify the author, identify the name of the website. And um, what we found is that when you do some search about David Icke, it turns out he is a conspiracy theorist and former soccer player and a sportscaster. Um, in 1990, he visited a psychic who told him he was on earth for a purpose and would receive messages from the spirit world. This led him to state in 1991 he was the son of Godhead and that the world would be soon be devastated by tidal waves and earthquakes. So you want to kind of keep that in mind. You know, do you trust what this person um, who is a conspiracy theorist, do you trust what David Icke is saying? You know, and you were we were able to, to debunk this. We were able to look at this just by checking Wikipedia. So maybe, you know, check to see if there is a Wikipedia article on David Icke. And then as you can see here, we got a lot of really, really great information that way. Now, the final example that we have over here is a tweet from um, Occupy Democrats. So this is a um, this is a, a movement, a political movement um, for for Democrats and for on the left. And as you can see on the <clears throat> on the post on the tweet on the tweet, it says um, this was going around around the Dobbs decision that that really intense summer where um, the Supreme Court struck down Roe versus Wade, and it's saying. Um, while that this is happening, you know, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and his wife Ginny post a photo of themselves enjoying a five thousand dollar bottle of wine. Um, and with the Jobs Dobbs decision, I can't remember. I think it was twenty twenty two, of when that that actually happened. Is that you know you want to go back to the T part and sift you know trace claims back to the original context and think you know context is everything. Um, you want you can check Politifact, you can check Snopes. You can also check other newspaper outlets to see what they are saying about this. Turns out the photo is not from um, the summer of when the Dobbs decision happened, the Supreme Court. Turns out it's from 2018. And as you can see here, that is the original post. That's the original Instagram post that was from that was from 2018, you know, four years before um, that 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 even happened. But what does it do? You know, it's designed to stir up emotions. It's designed to advance a political agenda. That this is a perfect example on how photos can be taken out of context in order to mess with your emotions to make you know to make you to make people rile up, you know. All right. So in summary, you know, context is everything. This is the most important. If you were to take anything out from this, is that you want to you know keep in mind that like context is everything, and you want to be mindful when you pick up your phone, when you pick up your devices. I know that is very hard and very difficult to do. I struggle with it day to day, but um, you want to just be mindful when you are and be purposeful when you are looking at information and everything like that. Okay, and then there is my information right there on the screen. Um, and so that's that's all I have. Thank you, Nico, for teaching us this class on misinformation and fake news in U.S. elections. Thank you, everyone.